Hey guys, welcome back to From Beauty to Truth. Today we're going to look at Sonnet 30 from William Shakespeare. For my money, it might be his best ever. Who knows? So we're using the handy dandy Norton Anthology of American, excuse me, of poetry. American poetry is a different volume. We see we got lots of tabs here on the Sonnet 30. When the sessions of sweet silent thought, I summon up remembrance of things past. I sigh the lack of many a thing I sought, and with old woes new wail on my dear time's waste. Then can I drown an eye unused to flow, for precious friends hid in death's dateless night, and weep afresh love's long since cancelled woe, and moan the expense of many a vanished sight. Then can I grieve at grievances forgone, and heavily from woe to woe tell o'er the sad account of forebemoaned moan, which I knew pay as if it not paid before. But if the while I think on thee, dear friend, all losses are restored and sorrows end. So why is this maybe Shakespeare's best poem ever? It's probably not, just to be totally honest, but it's up there. It's so concise. And all sonnets are 14 lines long, so how can it be concise? What I mean is there's not a wasted word here. He spends three four-line stanzas, four quatrains, talking about the power of the mind in the negative sense. So when to the sessions of sweet silent thought, when he turns his mind to remembrance of things past, I sigh the lack of many a thing I sought. So when he chooses to remember the things that he didn't have, with old woes, he has new wails. So again, it leads to tears. Again, it leads to crying. The think the old phrase from the Bible, there'd be wailing and gnashing of teeth, right? So it should have been sweet, silent thought, but he takes these sessions of sweet, silent thought and he recalls the old woes. And his eyes unused to flow. So all of these little lines are painting a picture. They're painting a picture of someone who should be having sweet, silent thought, unused to crying. He's had trauma in the past. He's had something bad that's happened in the past, but in this moment, he's relatively healthy. He's relatively happy and yet, by focusing on those past negative experiences, he can drown an eye unused to flow and weep afresh for love's long canceled woe. So he has love, love cancels woe. Love canceled his woe long ago. He's recovered, he's moved on. Love has canceled woe. And yet when he turns his mind to it, he can weep afresh. He can grieve at grievances forgone and heavily from woe to woe tell over the sad account of four bemoaned moan, which I knew pay as if not paid before. He's paid the, the, the woe before. He's grieved at his losses and he's healed. And yet he has to pay again, new pay. This is the picture that he's painted. This is why it's one of his most concise poems. Every, not even every line, every half line, you learn something new about, about the speaker of the poem. Quick aside, never ever say the poet. It's always the speaker of the poem, okay? So some poems are autobiographical, but even if they are, you still want to say the speaker. Uh, most poems are not actually from the viewpoint of the poet. On to the turn. The last two lines, the little couplet at the end. But if the while I think on thee, dear friend, all losses are restored and sorrows end. So he just spent 12 lines talking about the negative capacity of his mind. He can turn his thoughts to sorrowful things, and even when he's in time of joy, be sorrowful. Yet the opposite works too. If the while I think on thee, dear friend, all losses are restored and sorrows end. So what does that imply? That implies, eh, yes, when he's happy, he can think on thee and obviously remain happy or stop being sad as he changes thoughts. But probably even if he experiences woe again, even if he has new losses, he could choose to think on thee 
and be happy, right? So this poem is such a beautifully concise examination about the power of the mind. What we choose to think about, what we choose to dwell our thoughts on, what we choose to center our thoughts on, affect our mood, our personality, our life. Everything that we choose to dwell in, not necessarily think because thoughts come and go, right? But what we choose to think about consistently, and repeatedly, the sessions, plural, of sweet, silent thought. These things stay with us. They live with us. And even if uh, they're not about our present circumstances, they soon become our present circumstances. That's Sonnet 30 by William Shakespeare. As always, please check out my substack, From Beauty to Truth, for more poems, more analysis. You can get weekly, bi-weekly, actually, emails. So go and subscribe there. Subscribe here on YouTube. And y'all have a great day.